Hi, welcome to another Miami Corona Project conversation. Deeply honored to have a colleague uh, with me in this conversation today. With us, we have Alex Becquero, who is the chair of our sociology department at the University of Miami and a distinguished scholar in arts and sciences. Alex, welcome to the conversation. How are you doing? Pleasure to be here, Xavier. Thanks for having me. Sure. I know that uh, um, you know Miami really well. Uh, we're thrilled that you are, uh, have returned to chair our department. I just wanted to talk to you, uh, I, and I know you're probably setting up, you probably have contractors, and people just getting your house set up and your department and everything set up. But welcome to Miami again uh, with COVID. Uh, how are you doing and uh, how's your family and how, uh, how are you coping with this, with this pandemic? Well, thank you, thank you for asking. Uh, we're all safe and well. Um, you know, I, uh, was, it's been a very interesting past six months of all of our lives. Um, you know, I was in uh, in Dallas before I got here, and we, uh, you know, our semester in teaching was flipped on 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 a switch. And our whole world was flipped on a switch. You know, and there's no book that you can get off a shelf um, that lets you say, "Here's what you do personally. Here's what you do professionally." You know, we're we're all out of our element and not doing the things we want to do, and what we love to do. Um, so moving here was interesting uh, in terms of selling a house, buying a house, contractors, inspections. It was all very just a, a surreal experience. Um, but you know, you learn from this experience, and you you kind of learned uh, what you need in life and what you what you really value in life. Um, so we've been living without a refrigerator for three weeks, and we finally got a refrigerator. But it's amazing how you get used to living without a refrigerator. <laughs> Um, and so you manage, you just figure it out. Uh, and so a lot of us are just figuring things out on the fly and having to readjust not our priorities, but the things we took for granted, um, you know, going to a concert, going to a baseball game, just things that you just took for granted that you, you, you're not, we're not going to be able to do this for a, a long while. Um, and even when there is a vaccine and everybody's focused on this vaccine, it doesn't mean that all 300 million Americans are going to get it in the same day. I mean, this is, this is not a six month operation. This is a, we're going to be with this for a long, long time. Um, but I think it's, it's also brought out some good in people and it's brought out some not so good in people. I think the good that it's brought out in people is, is you're now starting to see people actually pay attention and heed the guidelines. Um, because it's, it's kind of like this, the social contract where we have to rely on one another to keep each other safe. Uh, I think people are starting to see that. Um, it's also brought out um, the inequalities in a really stark way to people. Um, you know, the, the COVID-19 and the calls for social justice are also a cause about health justice because the, the COVID pandemic has brought about um, and exacerbated the inequalities in, in communities of color. Um, people who are on the front line of, of wor the workforce are those individuals who are most at risk of COVID-19. They can't work from home. Uh, the people working at restaurants and in the malls and at Home Depot, they, 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 can't, they have to go to work, they have to physically go to work and they can't leave their jobs. Uh, and so what we're seeing in, in some of these communities, unfortunately, is the hospitalization rates and the death rates are, are bringing a toll on those individuals who do not have the resources to, um, to manage this pandemic. Uh, and it's unfortunate that our, our federal leaders can't figure out a way to give people a few more dollars. I mean, we, we, can, we can throw rockets in space and, and, and you know, make, make a, F-15 fighters and without a problem, we, we can't give people an extra $400. I mean, this is, it's just kind of silly. Um, but, you know, it is what it is at the federal level. Um, but I also see that some jurisdictions are doing a good job. Some, some people are making good decisions and we're starting to see some positive trends. Um, so it's been interesting, you know, on a personal level, uh, on a professional level. Um, and, uh, it's just a, a really weird time. Um, I'm, a, I'm a physical in, in person kind of guy. I like to shake hands. I like to meet people in a room. I like to teach in a room. The serendipity of being together, um, you know, there's nothing like that. Um, and so I, I look forward to a day when we can have that. I, I'm teaching face to face this semester. I'm very excited. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's going to be weird. Uh, we're all going to have you're, masks. You're teaching mask to mask, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm teaching <laughs> math. It's right, M to M instead of F to F. <laughs> 
I have a hundred person classroom with like 30 people in it. So it's just me really weird because it's gotta be about a third of what it can hold. Um, but I want that experience uh, with, I want to look the students in the eye in the room. Um, and so um, that I'm, I'm going to try to be as normal as possible in a very abnormal day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're going to unfortunately get back to abnormal. Right. I, and that's the, the, what I really want to talk to you about because things weren't rosy uh, in February of 2020. In fact, they were horrible. And as you just said, the pandemic has exposed how horrible it was. I, I read a recent op-ed by you uh, about a zip code in, in steep South Dade. I know that zip code well because after Hurricane Andrew, I went there to work in Florida City and to work with the migrant workers. Uh, and those trailers looked like pretzels. It was just horrible, right? The, the conditions that the hurricane, I mean, the eye of the hurricane went through there on August 24th, almost, you know, we're almost at the anniversary back in 1992. So I, I I, w I read that article with great interest, but what you brought out from that article obviously has universal appeal across, uh, well, definitely across our nation. Um, and I just wanted to to start there um, to, to have you talk a little bit about um, the observations that you made and then um, ask you the question, when we made the social contract, uh, did we really uh, have competent counsel? Did we really make a good social contract here when so many um, of us aren't covered, you know, by all the clauses in the contract? And how do we, how do we create a new contract? And I've been saying this in asking this in different ways. I ask politicians about it when I interview them. You know, I ask all sorts of folks because um, we don't know how, there's no, uh, as one of the mayors said, there's no uh, owner's manual on how to operate through this pandemic. It's mm -hmm. it's all on the fly. It would be great if there was, a, as you said, if there was a national policy, so at least there'd be a yeah. coherent outlook. And if there weren't conflicting um, communications at the local uh, leadership, at the state and national leadership, it'd be great if there was a cohesive fact, evidence-based approach to this, we would right. be out of it faster. But there isn't. And I am so worried that when um, a year after the vaccine is done and we figure out all the issues that come with that, where it feels like it's okay to normalize, how do we not normalize? How do we, um, how do we understand that nothing's really changed at the community level and that there's another pandemic coming because that's what sure. climate crisis does. So if you could please, um, and I mean, I've read it, but some other folks haven't, just explain to us the, the points that you made about the slice of South Florida, the, the southernmost county, uh, zip code in our county. And and then from there, let's just discuss the social contracts, what's what's missing. And you had some solutions there, but let's, let's, let's have you talk to us a little bit about what you saw. Yeah, so there, there's a lot there. Um, the the zip code um, in Florida City um, was uh, I, it was a piece in the Miami Herald a couple of weeks ago that talked about how the pandemic has adversely affected this community, um, just as other things have affected that community. Um, and that community has a lot of immigrants and migrant workers, um, a lot of people in poverty, uh, a lot of lack of health insurance, a lot of um, concern about systems and doctors and all kinds of things. And so the community has bared the brunt of the pandemic with respect to deaths and hospitalizations, um, and also um, has brought, bared the brunt of unemployment, where almost four out of every 10 people are unemployed. And it's, it's one of the most unsafest cities when you look at victimization rates in, in the city of Florida. And that's one of the points I was raising is that, and you can, you can insert that zip code in any other major city. Uh, where I came from in Dallas, and in, in the south part of Dallas, there are three zip codes that are basically responsible for about 75% of every social and health and crime problem. Same thing is true in, in Washington, D.C., where I grew up in the southeast part of the D.C. area, is an area called Anacostia, which is responsible, once again, for the, the brunt of all the, the ills. And these ills, unfortunately, more often than not, are communities of color and they're generational. So what happens to today's kids is next year's moms, next year's grandmother. And so they get transmitted through those generations and those kids who are born in those areas already come to the table or the plate with an 0 and one count or an 0 and two count. So when, when they're 18 years old, they already have a, a limited set of options and opportunities uh, for education, 
and not just employment because there's employment and then there's gainful employment. And there are big, big differences between someone who's working in a gig job or working in a fast food place and someone who has a actual career with health benefits, 401ks and the like. And the world's not different in that regard. And so we really are at a, at a, at a watershed and crisis moment in this country where social health, racial, economic ills are being magnified, uh, they're intensified, and they're now visible to people. Um, we have, as you correctly noted out, since the pandemic uh, hit in the United States in late January, absolutely no federal strategy of coordination uh, and planning. And we always, as leaders and administrators uh, in our lives, we have to always plan for the worst and hope for the best. And when the administration eliminated the, um, the, uh, the let's say, let's say the, uh, the working group on, t on pandemics and what you do when this happens, um, that really shows you what happened. You know, this is a little flu that's gonna go away and then, and then it didn't go away. And then, oh, we're getting better and then we're gonna do all this and, and not have enough PPP. And, and it's just the coordination. So there's, there's the federal problem. But we know the federal problem always exists in lots of coordinated efforts or lack thereof. Then you have 50 states who do 50 different things. And then you have hundreds of counties in different states doing different things. Uh, so where I came from in Texas, the state had a pseudo policy and every county had their own policy. And then, and then in some cities, Xavier, uh, some cities actually uh, cut across different counties. So I lived in, in a city called Richardson, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas. We were in two counties. So, so there's a city that's in two counties. So who do I follow, right? So, and, and the same, similar things are true in Miami, right? So you have Miami, you have Miami Beach, then you have Miami Dade. And then, and then you have the state that, you know, whatever it is that the, the governor is doing. Um, and so what you, you, what you need is you need a leader who's going to say, look, this is what the problem is. This is what we need to do. And if we do this, this is what we're going to have. And I think that what's so refreshing about the University of Miami is our president, Julio Frank, has delivered a clear and, and consistent message. Uh, obviously, he has the experience of managing multiple pandemics over the course of his life. Um, so this isn't his first rodeo, yeah, but he knows what, <laughs> and, 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 and the health department of a, of a, of a huge country. Um, and so he, he not only knows what to do, but he also knows what not to do. And I think that that's a very important, it's not, it's not a distinction without a difference. It's a distinction with a very clear difference because you, you, you need to know what didn't work before and what's going to work now. And so you have to remind people and tell people that it's not just about you. It's about your 60 year old grandmother. It's about your spouse or your significant other, because it, it, the, the worst part of, of any of us, whether we're 14, 18, 55 or 85 is there's a sense of invincibility. And the worst part of all this is we don't know what we don't know. Right. And so I think the pandemic is bringing all of that to the fore. And what we need is we need leadership that says, this is what we're going to do now. And this is what we're going to do in six months. If what we do now works, look, every one of us wants to go back to a movie theater. We all want to eat in a restaurant normally. We, this is, we're humans. Humans are social creatures. Even for individuals who are um, shy, being and staying home is not is gonna is gonna drive them you know crazy at some point. Um, you can only you can only do this for so long. So we're creatures of interaction. So if we want to get to that point, we have to invest now, and we have to invest in people, and we have to invest in places. That kind of investment will help social inequality, racial inequality health inequality. There's an old um, uh, a motor oil company and my dad used to um, change the oil in, in, in our cars when we were growing up because we were, we, were, we were pretty poor growing up. And a brand called Quaker State. And Quaker State had this great ad, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And so we need to invest in people and in places now because that way when they're 16 and 18 years old, we're not paying for them again, but they're paying back to society writ large. And I think what we have right now is an opportune time for students at the University of Miami and students in any, any university or college in the countries. You can now act as a leader. You can wear your mask, 
you can follow the rules, you can wash your hands. There'll be a time for partying. There'll be a time for going out. There'll be a time for all of that. But right now is not the time to do that. And so we have to, we have to sacrifice now for what we might get later on down the road. Um, and individuals need to think about that long-term strategy. And if we invest in people and places now, we can help those communities that need the help the most. So we can do more by giving free testing. We can do more by what some of the athletes that we see here in Miami doing. They're going and giving uh, PPPE to, um, to disadvantaged communities. They're bringing backpacks full of, of school supplies and food to the neediest communities. Uh, we don't always hear about those stories, but those stories are happening. And I think we need to invest in those kinds of communities because when we invest in those kind of communities, we're investing in us and our souls. As, um, as a society, and I'm not trying to talk tax policy here, uh, but yes. as a society, how do we do that same thing, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, apprehension, I think, because, um, and, and you know, you know the, the political things, welfare moms, or you know, the, the, the way that you create enough doubt uh, to, to pause, the way political systems do that. When it's not welfare moms, it's actually women with children who need to be taken care of. Absolutely. That's what they are. And the way you take care of them is by taking care of the welfare, the, the good of society, but somehow they get demonized. So how, from a social, perspective what is it that doesn't allow us as a society to go there is it greed is it um is it a sense of we're all fighting and we got to take care of ourselves because everyone else is about us in other words it's either us or them like what is it about our and this is a, i think there's a human species thing there's a there's this sense that um that uh we've been good and we went bad but there's been nothing but war and violence and torture yeah. our entire human history, as well as a lot of good and love and all that. But yeah. let's let's not not create a, a false um, narrative here. Like what? But my hope is that we get better and better, which with yeah. each millennium, right? So my question is, um, God, I thought this pandemic was going to make us better, but all it did it was it made the good people better, and it made I'm not going to call them bad people, but it made the open people more open and it made the closed people, you know, yeah. even more, more, more closed. And I'm just wondering, what does it take? What, like, how I, do we change this? I think that there are two answers to your question, at least the way I've, I've thought about this pandemic and reflecting upon how we've um, dealt with it. Um, I think the first problem we have seen is that there's a line being drawn in the sand, that you're either over there or you're I, over there. Right. Um, and that message has started three years ago with the, um, the president of the United States um, when there's, you're either with them or you're with me. And we can't operate the world with them and me. Um, and I say this all the time is, it, you know, I don't care if you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, male, female, trans, it doesn't matter to me. You have blood here and it looks the same. When I, when I get a cut, we all bleed the same, right? So we all want, we all have the same stuff in us. So we are, we are more alike than we are different. And I think what people do, uh, and I think they're being shown to do this, is to look for the differences rather than looking for the commonalities. So here's a good example. When, when the House and, and, the, and the Senate um, tried to come up with police reform in the wake of the, the George Floyd killing, um, they each had their own uh, law, uh, bills. And there was a lot of similarity in the bills, and then there were a lot of differences in the bills. We're, and they, they didn't get anything done. So here we have in the last two weeks, after the first set of economic stimulus for the, the, the employment benefits rolled out, uh, the $600 went away. Then some people said, let's do 70% of $600. Then, then, then there was like $200. Then it was $400, and then the president signed the executive order that says $400. And oh, by the way, 25% of it has to come from the state. Oh, okay, how interesting. And so what, what's happening is people are not focusing on where we can find something together. So when you, when you take a Venn diagram, right, you, have, you have the opposing circles, but then you have that circle in the middle. And that circle in the middle is the stuff we can agree on. So let's just agree on things right now 
and do them in a short-term fashion. And then let's figure out the stuff over time rather than just stopping everything, which is the way decisions are being made. So I think that that's the first problem. I think the second problem, which is a function of that, is that we let perfection be the enemy of good and perfection be the enemy of progress. There is no perfection. It's like writing an article or, or painting a painting as, as you, in your world. There can always be something better done when I'm writing a book. I, 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 when I'm writing an op-ed, I, I could have written that paragraph better. Oh, my, if I just had this. But, but at some point, you have to stop and you have to let it go. And when you come back to it, it's like, oh, yeah, I could have done that better. But you, have to, you can't make progress if you don't do that. And so I think right now, we don't see progress being made because people are talking past one another and they're not working together collaboratively. And working to together collaboratively doesn't mean you don't have disagreements. I mean, disagreements are, are what makes us stronger. It's what makes us intellectually better and intellectually more curious. And I think what we need to do is get past the us then, no, my way is the best way, it's the high, or and if it's not, it's the highway, and, and focus on where we find points of agreement and uh, not points of disagreement. When there's a revolution, though, you don't think that way, right? When there's a revolution, it's just like, let's completely off with their heads, right? So Yeah, and, and we saw that in some of the reactions, Xavier, to, to, the, to the George Floyd killing. People went immediately to, let's disband the police. <laughs> we can't disband the police. You know, you're not going to call Ghostbusters, you know, when, when something happens. And so, they're, 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 and, and that's where people are in this in this world now, whether it's the Floyd killing or whether it's a pandemic. I mean, you see people now walking on streets uh, or, or attending rallies, uh, you know, bike rallies and, and going to the beach and saying, well, I have a constitutional right not to wear a mask. No, no, no nothing in the constitution says anything about you not having to wear a mask. There are laws in the world. There's seatbelt laws. There, there are laws that you have to follow. And right now we have to follow this law. So some people are, are still seeing, and it's this us, them. It's us, them. And it, it's not a world of us, them. It's a world of us. And, and, and we have to get back to that social contract. And the only way you get to, 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 to that point is you have to tell people it's not about you. And unfortunately, America historically, uh, and under the last three years especially, it's about you and them. And I think that that's not a really good strategy. It's about all of us. I think the, when, when I meant the revolution part, what I meant was is that it's, it's, it's like the battle isn't about whether or not we address um, um, you know, police uh, uh, brutality or police issues. So the, the battle isn't whether or not we take care of this disease. The battle is really for the soul of this nation. And, sure. and that's why I see um, the recalcitrant of points of view. In other words, we have been so polarized that giving even a small win in a Venn diagram is not that, you know, uh, we compromised on this issue, is that we're letting the other side win. And the, the reason I asked at the beginning if, if there was competence of counsel in creating that diagram, just the very way that the Constitution is shaped by its very nature, um, giving, you know, uh, you know, small state like Rhode Island, the same number of U.S. senators as California or Florida. Yeah. There's disparities cooked into um, into the system, and then the system itself, uh, Citizens United, letting corporations have as much voice as people, also did did some of that. So when I when I asked you to look at three three zero three four, I was looking at. There's very, it's breadcrumbs, right? We can negotiate and the, and the negotiation is, yep. okay, great, we'll give you some breadcrumbs. Yep. When the entire uh, way that we operate and value human beings isn't. In, in the Trump world, three, and I was trying not to use the word, but in, in, the, in, in this administration, um, the, um, it's not us versus them, it's us and put them in cages. You sure. know, oh, yeah. So, so when, when the stakes are, are, are that high, then I can see the resistance to compromise. And the problem is that that resistance doesn't get us anywhere either, right? So I am, I'm in this place as a 55 year old uh, son of Cuban refugees sitting in this country wondering how do we 
um, I don't want to normalize. <laughs> How do we abnormalize into a better mutant, into a better thing? And I just, honestly, I'm asking you because I, this is my life work and I don't have an answer. Yeah. I don't, I think it's education and thinking people, sure. Yeah, but I just don't know how such a big problem gets fixed. I know it's how you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? You don't swallow the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, so my wife is a marathoner, uh, also a professor here at Miami. And one of the things that I've learned from her is that uh, you can't look at a, a marathon as 26.2 miles at the start of the race because you, it's the block. You can't have this block. So you have to have short-term wins. And so short-term wins are, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna listen to this song for three and a half minutes, I'm gonna get through this part. And then, okay, that's, that's three and a half more minutes. Okay, and I'm gonna run to that stop sign, so okay, I'm, or I'm gonna beat that car to that stop sign. So you have to have short-term gains in, in this process to win the long-term battle. And so I think sometimes people are looking at, I gotta do the end, rather than saying, here's what I can do right now. Yeah. So when we take a look at that zip code, all of those individuals, and that's why I use the baseball analogy, they don't come to the plate with an O and O count. It's just, it's just not happening. You know, so they're O and one or O and two, right? At, at, so they don't got many chances to swing the ball to get on base. Um, and it's, and I hate using that analogy, but it's a realistic one. And um, I think, you know, one of the, one of the things we've seen over the last three years is, uh, just so much disconcern for those individuals who don't have much, like trying to eliminate the Affordable Health Care Act, not giving people employment money. When we have one of the economic advisors two weeks ago saying, oh, people are gonna want to choose to stay unemployed because they'll make more money rather than work. No, I, I, I don't accept that. I think humans like to work. I think they want to work. Uh, I really believe that. And why they say these things, I, I know why they say these things, but that doesn't help because that, that, what that does is it fuels the perceptions about some people. And three years ago, this administration right away made it about some people. It was about immigrants and it was about dreamers. And you know, when, when, when the president started to talk about immigrants being homicide, homicide killers and rapists and those kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, first of all, it's not true. The, the, the empirical evidence doesn't support, support any support for that. But people don't buy that. They don't buy it. They'll just listen to what someone says and believe that it's true. And until we change that, and so by the only way you change that is you change your local leaders. And that starts at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. And this isn't a conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat thing, because there have been plenty of conservative um, leaders who have made good choices, just as, as there, there, there have been several liberal leaders who've made bad choices. Um, but you need a leader, and that's the thing. And a leader is a servant leader, not one who takes, 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 but one who leads by example. Uh, and we need that kind of leadership to have, to the, and then because if you have that kind of leadership, then you have coordinated efforts, and then you have sound policy that's based on science. And something we've seen in, over the last three years is the elimination of the use of science to guide policy. Uh, that's just dangerous. Um, and we need to move away from that. I think the only way you move away from that uh, is when you have new um, officials making uh, better decisions. And you know, the, 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 the poorest zip codes in Florida, and it's not just that one in Florida City, there are, there are parts of Miami that are, that are just, you know, you just the see it driving over. The I-95 yeah. border to the left just, of it, that's just to break. Yeah, yeah, you just look out the door uh, and, and, you, and you, then you look, then you drive a mile and a half way and then there's $5 million homes uh, and the disparities are only getting uh, larger and larger and larger in this country. And this isn't, I'm not talking about a move to socialism or anything like that. I'm not, I'm I'm not arguing about, for that either. I really am not. Yeah. I'm talking about investing in people. And, and that's not a hard thing to do um, if you want to do it. And so you have to start now and see the gains later. We're not going to see these gains right away, um, but there are short-term things that we can see right away. Uh, but the 18-year things are, are 18 years from now when most political leaders aren't going to be in their offices because most political leaders are in their office for running for their next office. Right. Um, unless you're the president and then there's no more offices to run to, obviously. 
Um, but I think we need to change a mindset about that. And we need, to, we need to think about what matters the most to people. And what matters the most to people is their health and their employment and their education. And that's what we need to focus on. So let's talk about health for a second. And specifically, um, I mean, I think uh, you've made a case and we all understand that uh, not having access to health care means that you're going to go to the urgent care uh, and, you know, or the emergency room and, you know, all the preventative, all the wellness, all the things that you do won't be there for you. And if you don't have health insurance, your doctor's your emergency room, just like if you're um, a child living in poverty, you don't get to sit with a psychotherapist, you get to go to juvie hall. That's the psychotherapy yeah. of, of children who are poor. So my, my um, so I, I mean, and we, you just explained to me how, how, to, how to eat that elephant one bite at a time and make small, small strides and, and getting to yes. And again, that article that, that, uh, that, you, that you wrote uh, for the, the op-ed piece ended with that, you know, that there are going to be, not everyone's at the table at the same time and little by little you have to, to get there. So thank you, I, I, I appreciate that. So let's take it away from sort of public policy and, um, and self-interest in politics and a lot. And let's just now, just if you, if you don't mind these uh, last 15 minutes we, we have, let's just talk about people, people to people and what, what drives them. And cause I, I, I want to explore this and, and I, um, I don't know enough about it, but what makes you go party with, and I realize that there's different leaders giving different opinions and, and all that. But there's a point where it's about selfishness because you, you kind of know that if you don't wear a mask, bad things will happen. Mm -hmm. right? You kind of know that, but you're also, as a, you know, it's like you're tired of this thing. I got to get out. I'm going crazy in my house, whatever it is, or my friends need me. So you create excuses, you rationalize. And I know you do this with, you know, when you have cancer, you look at a, at a, at a bump and you ignore it, or you, you have a headache and you ignore it. You sort of, you're in denial about things because that is so, the way some people cope but with something as big as a pandemic and you know that you've lost taste for three days so you kind of know you have this virus but you still sort of are, are in denial about it it's one thing to be in denial about it because you're scared for yourself it's another thing to literally be out there potentially as controversial as it sounds murdering people yeah right? so uh why <laughs> why would any human being do that like how does that work how do you how, how does that happen yeah so i'm I you know, um, facts are pesky things. Um, I think that I think there are a couple of things here. I think one, I think there's a sense of invincibility among some people. Um, and then there's a sense of, oh, well, even if I get it, you know, the symptoms are mild and it'll go away in a couple of days. Cause that's what they're, that's what people say, right? Oh, the deaths are among really old people. That's how that's what we first started hearing about, it, right? Mm -hmm. It only affects the elderly, you know, if kids get it, again, president said this, oh, they got strong immune systems, oh, they're athletes, no, no problem. Well, that's not, that's not what we know now. Um, and I think that, you know, you have this sense of invincibility in the sense of, well, I'm just gonna do this and to hell with the consequences because I'm living for right now. And, and that's where I talked about this social contract is the living for right now contradicts the investment in the future. Uh, and so this is where the, you know, when we go to school, we go to school to learn, but we're going to school for other kinds of reasons, right? Not, when you're 18 years old, you, you don't necessarily go to school to read Plato's, you know, Republic. You're going to school because it gives you a degree that then allows you to do some other things down the road. But, but that's an investment in something down the road. Wearing a mask is an investment in something down the road um, because restaurants can close again. Beaches can close again. So if people don't do their part, we're not gonna be able to do these kinds of things for a long, long time. Um, and so we have to just get people to stop caring about themselves first. And the only way we do that is drive the message home that you're not gonna have the things you want anymore. It's just not gonna happen until we do this and see these numbers go down. Um, and you know, I think that what you saw in New York City when the governor Cuomo, I think what you saw is a very effective leadership at the beginning. He had daily press conferences. He told people the facts, surrounded by doctors. And what Manhattan did, uh, and, and most of the state of New York did, now they are living what, what 
It was, it was good. They're allowed to, they're, it, they had it, they had a really three, four months of doing nothing, nothing. And what you saw with some other states where I was, Texas and Florida and California, is this push to reopen without the data let, saying to you, you can reopen. <laughs> So, you know, the 14, uh, 14 day window of the, the data has to look this way, then you can do this. In Texas, we just, we just went 50%, let's just open it 50%. So, what, what, no, the, and, and so there's the problem is the data have to guide the policies. So is it that, is it that um, we as, as humans are creatures of, of, um, of, of um, like, um, basically conforming. So in New York with strict leadership and strict guidelines and, and seeing all this death, if you were, you were an oddball, if you weren't wearing a mask, not an oddball, you were actually uh, memed and uh, demonized. Right. You, you have so, to flip, you have to flip the narrative. You have to flip the narrative. You have to say, you know what? The abnormal people are the ones who are not wearing the masks. So when you get everybody doing it, and that's the thing is you have to get you, it's not about flattening the curve. It's about changing the curve. So, you know, in American society, as you know, we, we are a very individualistic one. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's about, I'm going to do what I want to do. And if you look at other countries around the world, and Asia is a good example of this, mask wearing is the norm in a lot of Asian countries. So you have a different mindset where it's not just about me. And so you have to get more people to use masks and then less people to not use them. So how do you get people to use masks? You have to make it fun. So for kids, hey, design your own mask. You want that woman on your mask? Great. You want to do little fangs on your mask? Great. So you have to make it fun for people. So, so it's not a chore. And it's something that, oh, now you can like, you know, put bling on your mask. And who's got the coolest mask? So you have to make it somewhat rewarding for people rather than, oh my God, it's itching. I can't, you know, can't talk. I can't see people's mouths. So you just have to change the narrative. And the way you change the narrative is if you make, is you make it, uh, you have to reward people positively for it. And then you have to make it fun for people. And you have to change the mindset and say, look, this isn't about protecting you. It's about protecting the people you care about around you. We were a country of spitters a long time ago. Like literally, right, right? you would go to a barber shop and you'd spit. That's just the norm, like spitting and smoking, all that. But then yeah. it became really like, uh, weird, like, like you're yeah. disgusting if no. you spit in public, right? Smoking is, you know, I'm glad you brought up smoking. Smoking is a really great analogy to this, where you've seen the, and, and I'm talking about regular cigarette smoking, not e-cigarettes, but the, the regular uh, tobacco smoking uh, rates in the U.S. have gone down, I mean, just, just like this, you yeah. know, it's less than 20% now. There was a social movement that said, and, and aside from the fact that the science was saying, this is gonna kill you, probably, if you keep doing this, you're gonna probably die. Uh, so the science was catching up, but it just became something different for people. Restaurants started banning it. Not only was it a section, it was a whole area. Then, then certain uh, uh, sports facilities started banning it. And it became now, oh, and your clothes, people's clothes started to smell, and you got around, and so it was hazy. So, the, the, so everything socially about it changed. Yeah. It took some time. It took some time to do that, but it eventually started happening. The same thing with seatbelts. Um, now all you see most people wear seatbelts because it's just now becomes a habit and that's what you should be doing. And so the mass thing, I think, I think is gonna start getting there because people have had things taken away from them that they took for granted. And when you take things away from people, the only way you can get them to go back to it is what do I got to do to get it again? So for me, I, I love going to the gym. I, I, I can't do that anymore. I love going to the movies. I love going to sporting events. I love going to concerts. I can't do any of that. And I miss that. I, I, I miss it. I miss going out to eat. I miss that. Um, and so what do I got to do as my part to make sure we can get to that. Well, I can do what I can do and I can try to be a, a, a model for other people. Look, do this. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. So in, in, in the uh, spitting issue, of course, it was tuberculosis and we needed to figure out how to prevent it. So, you know, by spitting, you spread, you spread the disease. So let's stop. With smoking, it was a secondhand smoke that I think got people right. to say, you know, you 
we can't do this. So the science was there, but then there was a social um, pressure Absolutely. to make that work. I, I just want to know how many, today I, I have my chart here because I, I record, I'm doing this, this diary of how many people um, die each day. We're at 1,939 deaths, 138,330 infections and 6,447 hospitalizations. What, what, what number do we need Floridians so that we actually, you know, we know the science is there, but what is going to, what does it take for that social pressure to come in and say, no, you, you, you can't do this. Cause right now there, I know there's, there's a regulation that you're supposed to wear a, a mask, but it's not like doing it with a sense of pride or a sense of I'm literally a, a soldier in this war against this virus. It's yeah. some are doing it regarding, and you know, I, I I'm only having these conversations is I'm trying to do two things. One, I want us to capture how we responded to this pandemic so that we know how to approach the next one. These lessons that I, I'm trying to capture so we don't go back to life as yeah. abnormal, but try to create yeah. a new normal. But secondly, really, I'm actually trying to move the needle today uh, so yeah. that people, you know, listening to us say, wow, okay, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what do you think it's going to take? Uh, how much pain do we need before we realize, okay, this is, this is real. Let's shut down again or whatever. Like, what, what does it take? For what we don't want is we don't want people to take these numbers and and so oh, well you know we had another set of infections today five more people died today and 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 it's just this running tally that's just you know you know in the background somewhere yeah um here's here's a good point um that i think will will um tie the knot here when the when the max plane blew up we had one accident and then we had a second accident and they shut all the maxes down and the maxes are still not flying, right? Boom, we're stopping it. That was 400 deaths. <laughs> we are at several thousand deaths and we're not doing anything remotely know, near what, uh, what Boeing and Boeing did. Uh, obviously they had to because the FAA told them to, um, but the sign said, you can't fly this plane anymore. <laughs> until you figure this out. Um, what we need is leaders to listen to the scientists. So when Cuomo said, I'm only gonna do what I'm gonna do in New York, if the scientists tell me it's okay to do it, right? Here, the, and then you have our president of the United States disagree with the two most notable scientists in the world. It's, it, it, you know, it'd be fine if he was a medical doctor, uh, and so that sets that until that changes, the numbers aren't going to register to people uh, until it happens to them or someone they know or someone really, really uh, important to them that changes the narrative. To, oh, my God, if it happened to that person, then it could happen to me. Maybe I need to change uh, what we have seen a little bit of is we've seen athletes and movie stars. Um, kind of come out and say, you know, I was infected with this. Please wear a mask. Whether that moves the needle, I don't know. It doesn't hurt um, because kids look up to those people. Um, so, but I think what we need is we need we need that you know people to realize, you know, this is think think what happened in 9/11. Let's think about that for a second. I was teaching class at the University of Florida uh, in that morning time slot when a beeper, back when the kids had beepers, one of my students' beepers went off, he was in the National Guard, and he came up to me and said, I need to leave class, we got an emergency in New York. I'm like, what happened? He said, a plane just flew into the World Trade uh, Tower. I'm like, what? No, 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 that doesn't happen. I was, I, was, I was in that tower a week before that. Is that I was there. Wow. And so that changed everything in the United States. Every, yeah. Right? Every, like that, like that. We had a, and this was under Bush uh, Jr., everything changed, right? Uh, Gi Giuliani, at that time, um, had a really, he, he was the heart and soul of the, of the American spirit of how the response was. And what we had, and we created the TSA, and we created the Department of Homeland Security. And now, now when we fly, we have to go through that. It's just, it's just the way it is. We don't like waiting in line, we don't like the searches, but it is the way it is. We need people to realize that we have eclipsed the number of deaths over and over and over again 
of 9-11, but haven't had the severity of a response that we had with 9-11 or that we had when the maps went down. So in my mind, we need the powers that be to realize the severity of the moment and they're gonna be judged by their response to this. And I think they have already had been, have been judged by their lack of a response to this. When you don't allow your, your most trusted scientific advisor to hold a press conference and you, and, you, and you zip his lip that he has to go on these talk shows overseas to get the message across, uh, it, 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 it changes people's opinions real quickly. Um, and so I'm, I'm optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. Um, what, I, what I do appreciate is that the local news and the newspapers continue to lead off and say, here are the figures, here are the figures. And they remind people, if you wanna get to a better rate of opening, this is the number it needs to be. But these numbers are still too high. These numbers are still too high. Um, we should be focusing, and I understand um, that there is a, a physical death, and I understand that there's an economic death. The, and and they're, they're working against one another, right? Because businesses need to open because people need jobs. So I, I get the struggle. It, it, it's there. And, and they're, not, they're, not, they're not fitting because they're, they're moving in different directions. But we need the severity of the situation we're in to be realized. The, um, the nation is going to change just like it did after 9-11. Uh, society is going to change. It has to. Um, what what do you think 2022 feels like? What do you think the world looks like? Um, and I mean it at, at every level, not just, um, you know, having a, a supply chain and uh, lots of PPE and, and practices ready so that we don't make the same mistake when another virus hits in 2024. But what, what, what will change? Like you and I are now talking through a Zoom. Um, I have yet to meet you in person with that, you know. I know. Many it's calls terrible. Had, but uh, but uh, what will change in our world? Um, what, what this is, and how will that change uh, human interaction? How will society change, you think? Um, well, as social you, know, I, I, you know, what's interesting about your question is, you know, there are some businesses that have used this as an opportunity to, to cut down. You know, now Google doesn't have to have people at the office. Now they can save money on electricity. Um, you know, the bandwidth now is I have to pay for my bandwidth. I can't go to the office and pay for bandwidth. I pay for lights on all day long in my office place. Right. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I, you and I can only do this for so long. This is, we, and technology is great. We love the technology but technology shouldn't replace human being interaction. There is nothing more important than human beings sitting in a room with serendipity and ideas. And you know, this thing, this isn't, this is, I see you, I could see someone in the moon. It's not <laughs> being in right. a room and shaking one's hand or giving someone a hug and saying, it's a pleasure to be here, let's chat. And it's just that that's it's just it's not the same. Um, that interaction um, is a really important one, and I think that the technology will not replace. Um, it could stand. It could substitute for, uh, but it it should only substitute for when the other thing doesn't work or can't work. Um, I do believe that we'll get back in time. Um, I'd say within six, 12, 18 months where we can be back in a more normal setting environment. But the world uh, will have but, changed, right? I mean, like, oh, um, yeah. in other words, the world changed. The way you would talk to someone is you would have to walk to their house and knock on their door because there wasn't a phone. So you would do, Absolutely. you know, so that, and then phones happened and then cell phones happened and then, and now this. So, so, and you just mentioned Google. There are, uh, for efficiency purposes, may not be great for the human. Uh, you know, condition, uh, but for efficiency purposes, industries uh, will find that, that this is the new norm. So I'm just asking, understanding that the world will have changed. There will be um, one or two years of students who did not get the kind of education and socialization Absolutely. that they should have. What, what do you think? And of course, I'm asking you to look at a crystal ball, but do you have a sense of what 
after after 9-11, things changed, right? Immediately yes. after 9-11, I remember I was doing a project called Absence of Place. Uh, it's in the collection of Pam now. And I was taking photographs of old buildings uh, that weren't there anymore. And then I would put a caption about the memory mm -hmm. that I had on that building. The building that replaced um, uh, Channel 4's studio, uh, where the daughter of my fourth grade teacher went on live saying, no, no, I haven't been kidnapped, I'm here, oh, wow. uh, was replaced by uh, our federal courthouse. So uh, this was in 06 when I was doing my exhibit, 05, 06. So, you know, four years after 9-11, I was taking a picture, you know, um, it may have been one of those little silver phones. I don't know if my phone had, no, it must have been a little silver phone. So I was taking a picture of the courthouse, which of course it was illegal to take picture of federal buildings because I could have been a terrorist, you know, um, mm -hmm. taking a picture sure. of the courthouse instead of doing an art exhibit. Yeah. Uh, so a prosecutor uh, took a picture of me taking a picture of the courthouse <laughs> saying, what are you doing? You know, we're gonna find oh, wow. what's your name, what's your name, what's your name? So my, my, my point is, is that society changes, you know, like, like people change, yeah. like, uh, so yeah. I'm just saying, what, what is life going to be like? So uh, I, you know, I think some good will come out of this. Um, you, you always have to find the good in the bad. And, and I think a couple of things I've seen already that I think will continue. Everywhere I go, whether it's a supermarket or on campus or even the beach or when I go running outside, there are people who are actually now separating and they're doing it on their own. Um, I, you know, it, when I went to Publix last week, it, I saw, there was someone, I was walking down the aisle, they immediately went to one different side of the aisle. So yeah. people, are, people, people are now so accustomed to doing this, whether it's six feet or four feet, they're no longer right behind one another. And no amount of, no, we don't, I don't think we need the stickers on the ground anymore. I think we kind of know what that four to six feet looks like. And no matter what the studies say about aerosols being 12 feet away, at, at some point you, you just can't, you can't do that. Um, but I think that that's going to come out of this. So we're going to, I think we're going to be less crowded. I think that you will see people wear masks on their own more so than not. I think that you're going to see that. Hygiene, for sure. Like hygiene. I think that, you know, now, I think, you know, our university, the University of Miami, every room has wipes and hand sanitizer. Two years ago, that didn't exist. Yeah. I mean, think about that. But there, it's everywhere now. It is, and I think it will be everywhere forever. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, the more, And I think people realize, okay, I, I can't, hold a shopping cart and just start rubbing my face anymore. Yeah. So I, I think that you've st we're, gonna, we're programming people to say, okay, well, I, I got to do this. And so I think that those are good things that will come out of this. Um, so I think that that's all, those are the good that's going to come out of this. I think that the good that also can come out of this is the need for coordinated response. I think, you know, because, you know, governors and senators and, presidents, there, there really wasn't a book that said, this is what you got to do. Uh, so now we know, okay, this is what we got to do. Immediately lock down. You said immediately yeah. do it. Just everybody stay home. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we didn't do that. We didn't do that right away. We, we sat on the sidelines for way too long. And then we opened up in some places way too quickly. And then people thought when you opened up, oh, everything's back to normal. No, no, no. It's not what it, that's not what it meant. Um, and so I think that there are some good that's going to come out of this, uh, just like there's some. Yeah, just so like I, I think Homeland Security was the way that our security apparatus right. is integrated in response to, uh, okay. I mean, 9-11 happened because we uh, weren't prepared for it. We, we didn't Absolutely. look at the, the data. I mean, there was some information here and there, but it wasn't put together. This pandemic happened again because uh, we we didn't have our, our plan. I do think that there'll be uh, a response. There better be a response equal to a homeland security because there are pandemics coming because of climate the climate emergency Absolutely. that's going to bring vectors of disease to especially South Florida. Yeah. But um, but nine eleven also had some really horrible um, responses where more yeah. people were uh, targeted and Absolutely. still. So what Absolutely. I'm getting at, and I, I hate to be. 
I think I, I, I had this interview yesterday with uh, some uh, friends from the university, from Arizona State University. Um, you know, like, I'm always like, like the bearer of bad news. I'm always looking at what, what I need to fix instead of celebrating the good things. So sorry. So as much as I, as much as I celebrate all the good things that are going to happen, I'm just wondering from a, a societal point of view, uh, do does this distancing, does this um, fear, does the otherness that happened in other plagues where there's scapegoating, are there things um, that will continue after the vaccine that will somehow change the interaction, the, the sociology? Uh, is, it, is a sociologist gonna look at America pre and post pandemic and see two different kinds of nations, uh, the, the way that people either care and love one another more, uh, think of themselves in the context of community more, or are they going to see a different kind of name? And like, what, what do you think? Like, if you were trying to figure out what you're going to research, and I know that's not specifically your area, but what sociologists would research about uh, how this nation has been transformed because of this pandemic, what would you want to observe? What areas do you think has some changes? I think what we want people to observe is, is has this changed them at all? Or has it changed some of the things they do? So when I think about it personally for me, um, it's changed a lot of the things I've done, but it hasn't changed who I am as a person. Yeah. So, it, it, so at the University of Texas at Dallas, where I came from, we have a ceremony at, in the spring where all the PhD graduates get uh, hooded by their major professors. It's a beautiful event. Yeah. I had four PhD students that I graduated this semester. I did not have that. Uh -huh. Yeah. live experience with they were robbed of that now we'll do that whenever the conditions allow it to do that but in the moment in time we couldn't do that so i lost that but i didn't lose the relationship and how i train and mentor my students and so i think and, and so there there are there are things about us as in our soul as people and then there are things that we do that are kind of around us and so what I think is gonna be really interesting going down the road is how people have coped with this as people. How has it changed their behaviors? And then what's gonna happen the next time around when this happens? Because now they know I had to go through that. That's what happened to me. I need to deal with that. Um, so I think that that is what to me will be the interesting thing about this. Uh, going forward um, and hoping, hoping that the response to the, to those who need the help the most uh, is at the top of the list next time around. Yeah. Right. Cause it wasn't this time. It wasn't this uh, time around and, conti Alex, and it continues to still not be. Yeah. Alex, thanks so much. I know you're really busy. You're, uh, Pleasure. you know, you're, uh, you're Great. setting up your, Department of Sociology, setting up your classes, doing all that. Um, just as a, as a colleague, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply honored and happy to, to, to be with you at the university. And uh, Likewise. I'm glad that you're here in, uh, in Miami. I uh, can't wait to continue uh, talking and thanks for sharing. Okay. Thank you very much. You have a great day. All right. Bye.